Bienvenue au Club Suisse de la Presse, bienvenue à celles et ceux qui nous suivent également en ligne. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, welcome in the Geneva Press Club, welcome online to, for this press conference, uh, Julian Assange, final bid to appeal against extradition. We have two guest speakers today, Christine Rafson, editor-in-chief of Wikileaks, and uh, Denis uh, Masmejan, who is the Secretary-General of Reporters Without Borders, Switzerland. Uh, Stella Assange, as you know, is ill and unfortunately not able to travel. Uh, we, thanks, we thank the Wow Holland Foundation and the Carriage Foundation for making this press conference possible today. Uh, why are we here? Because next week, uh, in London, on February 20 and 21st, a panel of two judges of the UK High Court will hear Assange's final bid to appeal against extradition to the United States. This two-day public hearing may be the final chance for Julian Assange to prevent his extradition. Two judges will review an earlier High Court decision take a, taken by a single judge on June 2023, which refused uh, Mr. Assange's permission to appeal. If extradited, Assange faces a sentence of more than 150 years for exposing war crimes uh, committed by the United States in the Afghan and Iraq wars. We will today explore how this decisive stage in uh, Julian Assange's appeals will determine his future and also uh, the fut future of the press and the freedom of expressions of investigative journalists all around the world. Wikileaks, Julian Assange's family, his wife Julia, of course, are calling for an immediate ending to the persecution of Julian Assange, as well as Amnesty International, the National Unions of Journalists, Reporters Without Borders, and virtually every civil rights, press, freedom and journalist unions in the world. Uh, I have the pleasure to now give the floor to Christine Rafson. Mr. Rafson, you can join us here. Uh, Christine, you are an Icelandic, uh, Icelandic investigative uh, journalist. You are the editor-in-chief of Wikileaks. You have been the editor-in-chief of Wikileaks since um, uh, 2018. Uh, you have been appointed editor-in-chief of Wikileaks by Julian Assange himself, and you have uh, continued the core mission of Wikileaks uh, and also led the ongoing campaign uh, for the freedom of Julian Assange. Uh, you Previously, you always were the spokesman for Wikileaks between 2010 and 2017, and you have been named Icelandic Journalist of the Year three times by the Union of Your Country's Journalists. So, Christine, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Isabel, um, for that introduction. Uh, I'm uh, pleased to be here, and, and, and thanks for the invite to have uh, this event here. Uh, Stella Sands could not be here unfortunately, uh, but she sends uh, her greetings since she is exhausted and uh, was taken ill. Uh, she's been uh, tirelessly campaigning for uh, uh, Julian uh, all over Europe and uh, that takes it its toll. So she has to uh, recover now and, uh, and prepare for the, uh, the important fight taking uh, next week in the courts in, in London. As Isabel pointed out, it's the, the last stand. It is uh, the uh, uh, pivotal point in our case in the fight for Julian Assange's freedom. Now, let me maybe, uh, for those of you who are not uh, familiar with all the details, uh, reflect a little bit about the backstory, because I'm constantly reminded but that uh, details are being lost and uh, this has been such a long fight and uh, there are so many uh, months in between any occurrences in the Julian Assange case that uh, the, uh, the institutional knowledge sort of, uh, if, if you can call it that, and even among journalists sort of fades out and uh, no wonder um, for us who have been uh, uh, fighting this fight we are still surprised to reflect back and 
and uh, uh, imagining that this all started almost 13 years ago, and it's been a fight for 13 years, a long one. Uh, but, uh, of course, it all began, so to speak, in 2010, although Wikileaks was uh, established uh, in 2006 by Julian Assange in 2010, uh, the year that I joined Wikileaks and left the, the, uh, the, uh, 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 the secure world of the uh, mainstream media, or so to speak, after 20 years on that front, was when uh, the publications occurred uh, that put uh, Wikileaks in the limelight and are the publications that actually are the foundation and what the, uh, the uh, persecution against Julian is based on. And I use the term persecution deliberately. Uh, I don't want uh, even to honor the acts of the United States and supporting nations by calling it uh, 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 anything but a persecution. But a persecution, it is a political persecution it should be called all the time. The release of the, um, uh, the helicopter video, which you might be familiar with, the collateral murder video on April 5th, 2010, turned a page. It uh, shoot, did shoot uh, Julian Assange in the, the limelight. It uh, showed the, uh, the um, assassination of innocent people on the streets of Baghdad uh, a few years earlier in July 2007. Um, uh, it showed the assassination of one of the uh, most uh, brilliant photojournalists uh, who was working in, uh, in Iraq, uh, Namir Nur el-Din, and uh, his assistant, uh, uh, Said Sma. They were both working for Reuters, and uh, uh, they should always be remembered, uh, and we should reflect back on the fact that uh, Iraq was the, the deadliest place for journalists in history, until replaced recently by Gaza, where at least I think the number is that from the beginning, from the conflict, uh, and uh, we should maybe not just co uh, not, not call it conflict, but uh, over the um, four months, I think one journalist a day has been killed in that uh, horrible scenario. But Namir Nur al-Din was killed by uh, American uh, uh, helicopter pilots who were laughing about it. We exposed that, and that was the first revelation of 2010 uh, and 2011 that it forms the basis of the persecution against Julian. Later in the summer, it uh, was revealed that uh, the, the field documents from the war in Afghanistan, uh, the Afghan war diary, as we called it, uh, and which was explosive. Uh, I had been uh, as, a, as, uh, as a reporter in Afghanistan a couple of times before, and uh, it was explosive news at the time because it showed exactly the nature of the war in Afghanistan and that it was a blatant lie that had been um, uh, presented to the world that it was all going fine, the, uh, the Afghan mission. And I... Even in 2008, I interviewed the head of the NATO forces, an American general in Baghdad, who was sitting very relaxed in front of me and saying, oh, it's all, it's going to finish very soon. We have just a little, a little bit of our pockets of resistance in this country. We have victory around the corner. We all know what happened. If we were, we should not have been uh, uh, surprised that it ended in the way it ended, in humiliation after 20 years of a military mission, but uh, it took another 10 years after 2010 for uh, the realization to get in. But anybody who dives into the material for that Wikileaks exposed should be in no doubt that it was a failed mission and should have ended then and there. Uh, in the fall of 2010, uh, the Iraq documents were published by Wikileaks in conjunction with the uh, major media organizations in the world which I believe that we thought would be somewhat of a shelter to be uh, a, a, a vibrant little organization, uh, but teaming up with uh, entities like uh, Der Spiegel, uh, El Pais, uh, Le Monde, uh, The Guardian, and The New York Times, uh, Channel 4 television, uh, even Swedish television, and Al Jazeera television. We thought that that would give us some kind of uh, support in, in, uh, in, in, in uh, 
political terms and acceptance of the fact that this is a journalistic entity, very much a, 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 a journalistic uh, a practice which should be safeguarded uh, by uh, everyone who believes uh, journalism to be uh, one of the cornerstones of uh, uh, democracy and our civilization in the uh, little corner of the world we call the West. Uh, but little did we know. Uh, it, uh, it was followed uh, through by the end of the year by, of course, the diplomatic cable release, 250,000 diplomatic cables from U.S. embassies and consular offices all around the world. A project that was carried on uh, in conjunction with all, more than 100 media organizations, uh, probably thousands of journalists at the end, over 10 months, uh, creating stories in every corner of the world, in every country in the world. And, uh, expose the underbelly of the, uh, the empire, so to speak, in the, the diplomatic terms. The effect of it uh, were uh, quite extraordinary in some cases, uh, like in, uh, in Tunisia in, in, in January, it uh, directly contributed to the, uh, uh, the, uh, the fall of the, uh, 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 the government uh, or the dictatorship in the country and uh, it sparked the flames that some call the Arab Spring. Uh, I would, I usually like to reflect to uh, uh, what uh, uh, the late journalist Robert Fisk uh, wanted to call it, uh, the Arab Awakening, awakening which is, uh, of course, we've seen it, it had a, a domino effect around the region. Uh, of course, there was pushbacks, but uh, I believe that we will still see the effect of that later on in, uh, because the, the, uh, the awakening, once you have awakened, you will not be that easily put back to sleep. That was just one effect. I've also mentioned, and it is not known to many, that one of the diplomatic cables, uh, a very important one, exposed a cover-up of a, a, a war crime in Iraq that caused such anger in Iraq that the Iraqi government denied the American uh, government the, um, uh, what they wanted, which was a total immunity for their soldiers in the country. And that scenario led to the formal pullout of the remaining troops in Iraq. So in, in a way you could say that a formal ending of the war in Iraq can be contributed by the uh, publication of Wikileaks uh, in these Trovo cables. Now, this is all back history, but the reflection uh, of, of that history is uh, of course now being endured by Julian Assange. Uh, once you kick the hornet's nest, they will attack you. Uh, we knew that and Julian knew that very well in 2010 and we discussed it. that. Uh, and I believe that he said uh, they will hunt me to the end of uh, the earth, and uh, so they have, and are still at it. And those who are uh, under the illusion that this is, has anything to do with the law, please wipe that notion out of your mind. It should be never be honored by calling it anything but, uh, uh, as I said earlier, a political persecution a re revengeful act of the empire who didn't like its secrets to be exposed. Uh, Julian uh, uh, was uh, in, in this long lawfare, uh, and actually a, a word which I only heard uh, uh, first uttered a few years ago, but is a very useful one to be used in our context and in our world today, uh, is uh, the uh, abominable abuse of the legal processes to uh, fight against uh, those who attacked your uh, corrupt interest. And uh, we see more and more of lawfare uh, being, and being used as a part of our political persecutions around the world, giving the illusions that this is somehow a uh, process that, that have legitimacy where they uh, are totally uh, avoid of, uh, of any such things. In 2010, uh, I just want to reflect on that, the, uh, 
one of the leaders in the uh, the uh, in the Republican parties were was outraged by the publications of WikiLeaks, and uh, and he said, uh, I think, uh, uh, if not quote unquote, but at least it's pretty close. Julian Assange should be prosecuted to the full extent of the law, and then he added, and if the law is is not there, we need to create that law. And that uh, has stuck with me because ex exactly that is the kind of thought of how you use lawfare against somebody who are uh, I I you deem as your adversary. And the crime of Julian Assange was simply a journalistic one, exposing uh, corruption and, and ill deeds. Uh, the Americans did not have to uh, invent new laws, but I will come to... To, uh, to another angle of that later when it comes to the British, they did, because the Americans had uh, uh, an, an old uh, uh, legal uh, element that had been gathering dusts on the, uh, the shelves in the US Just Justice Department for 100 years, the Espionage Act, which, uh, which, which had never been used uh, before against a journalist. It had been rarely used against those who actually committed espionage. Uh, and I think the, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, it, it came to light that this would, might be a tool that could be used against those who reveal and expose secrets. And after uh, the um, uh, things to started to darken in our world of freedom, after 9-11, the Americans to, found uh, th this, uh, this legal tool to crack down on whistleblowers. And uh, we said at the time, beware, it's now whistleblowers who will be attacked by this, this archaic uh, uh, legal tool, but journalists will be next. And unfortunately, I take no pleasure of, of, of uh, saying I told you so, but there has been frequent times where I could have done that. But of course we were unfortunately right. Julian Assange is the first journalist uh, publisher that is uh, attacked uh, with the use of this archaic tool. That happened uh, after he had spent seven years in the Ecuadorian embassy uh, where he sought uh, in London, where he sought uh, uh, refuge uh, when uh, against a, an attempt to drag him uh, in a very spurious manner to Sweden in a, to face sex allegations that became, of course, nothing in the end. There was never any reason for that to be con continued, and it has been exposed now by investigative journalists that uh, there were uh, cynical factors uh, behind the, the push by the Swedish government. And we now know that uh, the, the United Kingdom government and uh, its uh, uh, partisans were behind the push against the Swedes in continuing this, uh, this, uh, this, this fight uh, against Julian. But uh, in 2019, after a change of regime in, in Quito, in Ecuador, uh, and a new president that uh, thought it would be a good idea to sell out Julian in exchange, probably for uh, billions of dollars of support from the World Bank and the uh, IMF. Uh, the Ecuadorians took out the, this, this uh, unprecedented step to open up their doors to the, uh, to the British police and allow them into their territory to uh, uh, attack Julian Assange, uh, arrest Julian Assange. And uh, they exposed uh, on that same day uh, an indictment against Julian uh, on uh, a, a very strange hacking charts, as they called it, although there is no allegation of hacking in the charts. It is a simple PR exercise by the uh, US Department of Justice to call it a, a hacking chart. Uh, I can get back to the details of that later. Uh, but that had been in place for two years. Uh, so this had been, uh, uh, they had been, of course they needed a, a legal tool to, uh, to justify the request for extradition. And uh, so they presented on the same day as, as Julian was arrested, 
He was put in Belmar's prison, the ma maximum security prison in the, the southeast of London, where, which was built to house uh, uh, IRA uh, terrorists and uh, is now housing murderers and the worst criminals of uh, the United Kingdom, uh, and an intellectual and a publisher and a journalist, Julian Assange. Uh, in April, the spring, he will have spent five years in that dungeon. An innocent man, probably the only political prisoner in the United Kingdom, the only journalist imprisoned in the United Kingdom, something that should never be forgotten and an absolute stain on the reputation of uh, the British government to keep him there uh, on the inside under these circumstances. The Americans, of course, uh, were diligently working to upgrade the, um, the indictment against him, and uh, they did, and then we saw the glimpse of, of course, the Espionage Act, 17 charges uh, on the basis of the Espionage Act. Uh, so he is basically being charged with espionage. The uh, thing to remember about the Espionage Act is that uh, it does not allow for any public interest uh, defense. You have no right to... Uh, to go to court and, uh, and uh, uh, defend your action on the basis of public interest. This is the defense tool of journalists all over, all over the world. Our actions are uh, in the uh, um, public interest. Uh, we are acting as, uh, as agents of the general public. We are uh, reflecting the interest of the public, uh, but stripping you of the possibility of putting forth that defense legally takes away your entire defense as a journalist, so to speak. And it's a, it's a tool that uh, you cannot defend against. Uh, let me give you an example. You are, Julian is being prosecuted for receiving secret information. He is being prosecuted for possessing secret or classified information, not just disseminating the information. So even if he had just received information and kept it in his possession, he would uh, still be guilty under this act. So you can see how broad range this is, how horribly, horribly uh, serious precedent is being set by going after him on this basis. That is the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the big um, chilling factor for the community that we are a part of in the journalistic world. Um, and uh, the, uh, the repercussions if he is extradited to the United States is to face his uh, 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 court dates uh, and be possibly sentenced to 175 years in prison. That is the maximum penalty that they could allow to him. And uh, knowing the practices in the United States, uh, decades of imprisonment are easily handed out. So what he is facing basically is life imprisonment and conditions that would uh, almost certainly kill him. Uh, and that is supported by medical evaluation that has been presented to the courts in London and uh, has not been refuted by the courts in London, which is important things to note. Now, this, these uh, uh, almost five years now of battle against the extradition have taken some twists and turns. So if I may just sort of give you an overlook of that very briefly. Uh, Julian did fight against the extradition and uh, he won in the first instance in the courts. A magistrate uh, court judge in London decided that he should not be extradited. But uh, uh, Judge Baratzer in the magistrate court did it only on, on two important points. Uh, which are, of course, in uh, themselves very important. That his uh, medical situation was such that he was in 
a suicide, he was a, in a suicide risk. So the, an extradition, even a decision to extradite him would put him in a, in a suicidal jeopardy. And uh, secondly, that the, the prison conditions in the United States, which had been outlined to the court, were such that uh, they could, under no circumstances, guarantee his health in the United States prison. So it would be, be a, a serious threat and almost a death penalty to extradite him. On these two grounds, the, the, the magistrate court decided to uh, uh, against the extradition. On all other grounds, the, the, the magistrate court judge decided on the side of the American government. Uh, and these grounds are many. In this long and arduous process, and a part of lawfare is to drag out as long as possible the procedures because the, uh, the individual in question is suffering. It is punishment by process. That's part of lawfare, a very important part of lawfare to drag things out into infinity. Almost five years now, can you imagine? Um, and the Americans appealed to the, United, uh, to, to the High Court in London. And the High Court came to a very strange conclusion. They offered the American government to introduce uh, uh, so-called assurances. It's a diplomatic note. And it's, uh, if I'm paraphrasing, it says basically, we promise to, uh, to, uh, to be kind to Julian and treat him fairly in our prisons. We will not send him to uh, a supermax prison where El Chapo and other hardened criminals are housed. So he will be fine. And this, on the basis of this diplomatic note, which actually has no meaning in America, the Bureau of Prisons in the United States is notoriously independent. They do whatever they please, whatever the judges say. But on the basis of this ridiculous diplomatic note, the High Court in London decided to overturn the decision of the Magistrate Court and allow the extradition. And I don't know how much, uh, I have to, uh, you have to become a little bit of a lawyer taking part in all these battles. And uh, I don't know about the situation here in, 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 in this country, but if a new evidence is introduced in an appeal court in my country and in most European nations, and it is seen to have a strong implication on the case, which this piece of paper, this worthless piece of paper, and if you don't believe me, believe the analyzers of Amnesty International, which took one look at it and said, it's not worth the paper it's written on. If, however, anything of this sort comes to light, usually you send the case uh, back for a total re-evaluation by the lower court again, because there was obviously something overlooked. But no, the high court decides he should be extradited and forced, and forced the magistrate court to reverse her decision and order the extradition, which is, you know, a, a legal uh, process that is dumbfounding to legal experts that I've talked to and, and totally, in, uh, totally against any, any, any uh, uh, jurisprudence practices. So she was forced to do so. Now, that opened up the opportunity for Julian to appeal all, all, all the, the, the dozens of points that he lost on in the first round. And <laughs> there are so many of them. And these are appeal points that have never been heard in the High Court in London. They are actually the, 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 uh, the, the, the most important and valuable points in his defense against extradition and the fight against extradition. Yes, of course, the health issue is there, and the suicidal risk, of course, that is important. But look at factors such as the one that not even the extradition treaty between the United Kingdom and the United States allows for extradition for political offenses. And if any offense can be called political, it should be espionage. And one anecdotal element in that regard is that in the, 
1980s, then Senator Joe Biden fought with tooth and nail against the extradition of an IRA terrorist from Ireland that was able to escape prison in the LA Kingdom and flee to America. At that time, Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher had actually come to an agreement that an, an exemption should be made from the, the, this, this ban on extradition for political offenses and for this IRA suspected terrorist to be handed over to the British government. It was an, a, a favor that Ronald Reagan wanted to do to Margaret Thatcher. Joe Biden's senator emerges, and of course you understand that he has, has Irish background and uh, 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 Irish American community to adhere to. He, he opened up a battle against the extradition. We're talking about a guy who was suspected of blowing up, uh, 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 I believe, a, a, a British military installation in Northern Ireland. And he was able to stop, to rally senators against it. And he basically said, and I'm paraphrasing, this, this ban on extradition for political offenses is so important, it's such a golden rule, rule that even if we're talking about some bad guys getting off, we need to keep on to that sacred rule. This was revisited by, by, by uh, newspapers in Belfast last year. Uh, nobody else picked up on it. But in the extradition against Julian Assange, they totally overlook this treaty banning extradition for political offenses. And they wriggle around it. They actually ask for the extradition based on the treaty. But in the, in the actual courtroom, they say, well, that's the part of the treaty we want to rely on. Please extradite Julian Assange. But when it comes to this exemption, no, you should rely on the local law in, from 2002 or 3, which was uh, uh, set in the atmosphere of post-9-11, where, uh, uh, where uh, terrorists could be quickly renditioned. And uh, this is an argument that has not been, uh, never been presented to the courts. This, this, uh, this, uh, this, this uh, extraordinary twist and turn in the lawful, lawfare of, of the, the extradition treaty. Bear in mind also that it's now been established and it's, it's been uh, uh, presented to the courts and new evidence has come to light since this was first around, uh, in the first round in the courts in England, that in 2017, the US government on the highest level plotted uh, an execution of Julian and, and sought permission for his execution whilst staying in the Ecuadorian embassy in London. Uh, nobody has denied that this is the truth, that this was being plotted. And actually, the guy who was plotting it, uh, then CIA director Mike Pompeo, who become, became Secretary of State later on, has inadvertently confirmed that he was asking for this plot by demanding the sources of the report on, on, on this story to be arrested and put in jail. So, a confirmation of, of, of that, it, that it took place. So, in 2017, the, the CIA was plotting to kidnap or, toward, or, or kill Julian Assange in the Ecuadorian embassy. Uh, we have, uh, Julian Assange's defense has witnesses to corroborate this, and we have uh, uh, a well investigative, investigated uh, story by prominent reporters uh, uh, exposing this. Now, this has never been heard in the High Court. How can you even think about extraditing somebody to a country? where on the highest level, and I'm talking about inside the White House, there has been discussion and a plot and a plan to assassinate the individual. You would not think twice in any country. It would kill a case entirely, only on that basis. And it's one of Dawson's arguments that uh, Julian Assange is asking to present to the courts in London to fight against the extradition. Now, um, 
as Isabel mentioned in June last year, uh, a single judge in the High Court, after deliberating for 10 months, 10 months, and ironically, his, 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 his name is Swift, Justice Swift. He, he scribbled down a piece of paper, two and a half pages, and just dismissing, without any argumentation, the entire grounds. We're talking about almost 300 pages of documents outlining all the elements that Julians wanted to present to the court. Said, irrelevant, irrelevant. No, he is not allowed to appeal. So in, 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 in in that case, it was blatantly obvious, obvious that the, uh, the, the corruption was 100% uh, within the, the United Kingdom justice system and no justice to be had on that level. The only thing you have pro procedurally is to ask for a second opinion for, from, for two judges, uh, colleagues of, of, of Justice Swift, to review review his decision, and that is what is going to happen next week in the court. Uh, it is very limited how much can be presented. Originally, the appeal court wanted them to present the entire case in 25 minutes and limit the documents to 20 or 30 pages. So this is how they are treating this, in this, this blatant and obvious lawfare now being so obviously played out in the, the UK courts. But, so, so you are maybe understanding after this, this sort of past history that I am not too op optimistic about the outcome that these two new judges will disagree with their colleague and overturn his decision. I think there is a highly, highly, uh, uh, very unlikely we see that scenario. So, and it's important to, 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 to enter into that, that, that uh, uh, if you're covering that story, to enter into it with that notion in mind that this is, this is not justice, this is, this is the, the Queen of Hearts and Alice's in the Wonderland story. This is just off with her heads, uh, uh, justice, no justice, no justice to be had in the courts in London. So what options do we have? What can possibly happen uh, is that um, after this two-day hearing, the, uh, the, the two judges will uh, um, take leave and, and have a cup of tea and come back uh, two hours later and say, no, no, no case to be had there. There's a plane, the airplane waiting, had been warmed off on a military airport an hour away from London. He is going to be flown over to the United States immediately. That is a scenario that is realistically possibly happening after the hearing. Or they will make the assumption that they are taking this seriously and, and wait for some weeks, maybe decide that, that he could be tortured a little bit longer in Belmar's prison and, and, and hand down their decision in weeks or months. We don't know. The only option, if they do, is to... Uh, request for an immediate intervention by the European Court of Human Rights. And it has been planned to immediately set that in motion in Strasbourg uh, on the basis of, uh, of uh, so-called Rule 39, where the court can issue a, a request to stay the extradition, whilst they are looking into whether they will look into the case in, 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 uh, and the elements of the case. Uh, but that is not a certainty that the Strasbourg court will actually issue such a, uh, an important decision based on Rule 39. Um, we have no guarantee that they will see this as an, as an important enough case to, uh, to, uh, to take uh, that on. Uh, the court has been under attack, uh, especially for a similar decision in the, and against the, uh, the United Kingdom as well in the so-called uh, Rwanda refugee case, which has uh, uh, sped up the process in the United Kingdom that, uh, that uh, they want to abandon not just Europe but the entire human rights uh, uh, apparatus and, and 
withdraw from, from, uh, from, from Strasbourg. So we don't even know whether they will honor uh, a request to stay his extradition, even if that emerges from Strasbourg. And I can tell you that that, that, that is a strong possibility that they will decide uh, uh, politically, okay, we are leaving this, uh, this uh, uh, venue anyway, let's just not honor it and let's fly him over to the United States where uh, death awaits him in a, in a tiny cell somewhere. Now, so this is the, I think I'm, 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 I'm well over time probably, so I'm going to sort of cut it short here, but this is the scenario that we're looking at next week, so it's very important for us, of course, to raise the attention of it uh, and, and get people to, to, to look into the element of the case and, and, uh, and uh, reflect on it. I'm happy to answer questions afterwards, but I think I'll pause here. But the, the press freedom, just to sum up, the press freedom implication, which my colleague will speak of in detail later, is so huge. And, and somebody summed it up uh, uh, just in one sentence to me, which is runs through. He said, well, if the Americans can arrest an Australian journalist and, who publishes in Europe and put him in jail forever in the United States, not a single journalist anywhere in the world is safe. And that is the real threat to face the Espionage Act. So thank you very much, and uh, I'll pause now. Uh, thank you, Christine. Please uh, stay with us while we are listening to Denis Masmejean, the reporter Sans Frontières Suisse, Reporters Without Borders, uh, Switzerland, and please, uh, of course, prepare your questions online or here in the room for both Christine and Denis. Denis, uh, I give you the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Isabel and the Geneva Press Club for this opportunity to, to speak at this very crucial uh, time um, uh, about a uh, so crucial issue. I would like to start by uh, wishing uh, Stella Assange a speedy recovery. And of course, I would like to, um, um, to address on behalf of my entire organization, my thoughts of solidarity uh, with Julian Assange. Uh, in the next few minutes, I will try to outline what is at stake uh, in this case uh, from the point of view of our organizations. And uh, I would like also to explain very clearly why we think Julian Assange case is so important for journalism, for the future of journalism, and for press freedom. We have been defending Julian Assange for many years. Uh, our campaign's officer, our campaign's director, Rebecca Vincent, in London, has attended uh, all the British justice hearings in this case. She did so in uh, sometimes very difficult conditions uh, because the trial publicity was not always the first concern of the British judges in this case. We have decided to defend Julian Assange uh, because we are convinced that his prosecution, his um, extradition, his indictment are constituting a very dangerous precedent for journalism and for press freedom. Um, it's very important to, 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 to understand that Julian Assange is not being prosecuted for having stolen classified information himself. What he has done is con to contribute 
to making public information of very high, very importance of public interest. And he did it in collaboration with a pool of recognized news media. The case against him could in fact be brought against any journalist, US citizen or not. And you know Julian Assange is not a US citizen. It's important. This fact is very important. Julian Assange has never been working for um, the US Army or uh, a, a, a US agency or the US government. So it's, it, it's important to, to underline this, this fact. Therefore, he had no duty of confidentiality arising from his position and function. And he can't be, he can't be accused of having, having violated this duty. For all these reasons, uh, it's easy to show that the lawsuits against him could just as easily be brought against journalists what, of, of whatever nationality and wherever they may be. I really do believe that nothing serious can be said about this case without recalling what information, what kind of information is accused of having published. In particular, you know probably, there is this famous video showing a US army helicopter in Iraq, machine gunning civilians and machine gunning rescuers. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's unbearable and it's a flagrant war crime. And I think here in Geneva, the birthplace of the Geneva Conventions, we can, own, uh, we can only uh, be scandalized. Now, Julian Assange is paying a very high price for this and an inhuman price for having May made this information viable for the public. Um, we at RSF, we are sometimes asked why an organization that defends journalists and journalism, why we are defending Julian Assange. We are asked whether we consider him uh, a journalist or not. This question could be discussed for hours. The answer depends on prim uh, how we define journalism. But for us, this is not the, the point. The reasons why we are defending him are the very important contribution he has made uh, to journalistic work, to a very important journalistic work. Julian Assange helped reveal facts to the public. Uh, he, he, he served the public interest. He served the right, of the, the public right, to know what uh, must be uh, known. And as Kristen said, this is the first time that a, a law approved, approved in 1917, the so-called Espionage Act, has been used to prosecute um, a, a journalist or a, someone who helped to, uh, to publish 
some information of public interest. The very existence of these prosecutions against him is like to consider invest journalism and investigative journalists as a crime. As I said at the beginning, we are at now at a very crucial moment. Next week, a panel of two judges will hear Julian Assange's final appeal against his extradition. At stake in these hearings is whether or not he will be allowed to appeal. If his request is rejected, there will be no further possibility to oppose extradition before the British authorities. His extradition will be imminent. The last possibility is to take the case to the European Court of Human Rights. The UK, you know, remains a party to the European Convention on Human Rights. The judges in Strasbourg could then pronounce a provisional suspensive effect. It's the 39 rule, it's a paragraph of the rules of the court, and the judges can order the British government to stay the extradition. In other words, not to put him on a plane to USA. The question is, what would the British government do then? We hope it would respect the order given by the European judges. Otherwise, uh, otherwise, it would be a violation, a flagrant violation of international law, but we know that relations between the European Court of Human Rights the British government are perhaps not the best we could wish for. So uh, we, we, we have a hope, but it is a hope. I would like to conclude by once again assuring Julian Assange of our support and solidarity and to say to all of you that we will not give up. Thank you for uh, your attention. Thank you so much, Denis Masmejan. Thank you, Christine. Just um, uh, before we give the, um, uh, the floor to, of course, uh, the audience for questions online and here, just Christine, tell us how is Julian Assange doing? Uh, have you seen him recently? <coughs> yes, I'm, I'm one of the few who sort of uh, 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 on a, every few months to visit him. I think it's now two months since I visited him last night in Belmar's prison. Uh, he has, it is hard to describe. I mean, I, um, when we befriended 13 year, years ago, he was a young man. He has aged. Uh, it is uh, um, to be deprived of freedom and, and sunlight for all these years and having to be in this uncertainty for such a long time takes a toll. But he is, he is an extraordinary resilient, but his health is not ideal, uh, both his mental, mental and physical. Uh, he, is, uh, he has been suffering from uh, uh, illness in the lungs, and he actually coughed so much in a few weeks ago that he uh, fractured his ribs. Uh, Belmar's prison is, is not uh, a, a place to be for anybody, and uh, uh, during the most coldest periods, he had to stack the books he had in his cell to the window to try to create some isolations to keep uh, warm while fighting off fever and, uh, and illness. So I fear for him every day. Um, okay. he, is, uh, he has suffered tremendously. Uh, so Will I he be present in person uh, next week, the High Court in London? 
I don't know. Uh, we have not been uh, told uh, that whether he will be moved to. Uh, they could decide to to uh, to uh, put him in a, a little airless a little cell in the bottom of Belmars and and video link him into the. Uh, but uh, of course, he wants to be present in the uh, in the uh, in the High Court. Uh, um, yeah, but I. The, where we're actually is, is a, where he is treated like a terrorist and kept in a, 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 a glass cage um, with limited access to his lawyers. So it remains to be seen. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, I'll pass you the microphone. Please uh, present yourself. Thank you. Alfred Desires, former independent expert on international order. I have a question to both uh, Christine and Dennis. Uh, while the threat uh, to the journalistic profession uh, is more than clear, why are journalists not focusing on the breakdown of the rule of law and its implications, the corruption of the administration of justice, which is a matter that the rapporteur on the independence of justice of lawyers has to deal with. My colleague, uh, the former UN rapporteur on torture, Professor Niels Meltzer, published in 2022 uh, the book, The Trial of Julian Assange. Now, for me, Meltzer is the Emile Zola of the 21st century, and his revelations are far more serious, far more serious than the Dreyfus Affair, 1898. Uh, working group on arbitrary detention uh, also requested. I mean, I think the United Nations has been quite clear in condemning uh, the detention of Assange as uh, an arbitrary detention. Uh, I think among my colleagues there is unanimity uh, that the persecution of uh, Assange constitutes lawfare and that it has a huge implication with regard to the breakdown of the rule of law in the United Kingdom, in the United States, in Sweden, and in Ecuador. Thank you. Who wants to first start by answering? Christine? Well, it, it was a, uh, thank you for the question. It, 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 was a, uh, uh, <laughs> it was a large question. Um, we, because you're talking about, of course, the uh, the uh, uh, a part of a process that has been going on for a long time, which is, in my opinion, the erosion of international order. And I have sometimes said to people, in that horrible um, scenario. Julian Assange has been the canary in the coal mine. I was astonished when the, uh, the, uh, the Swedish government, the United Gov Kingdom government, decided to totally to disregard the findings of the Working Group on Arbitrary Detention, a very important United Nations mechanism. And I said, why isn't there more outrage? These two nations are undermining and destroying the credibility of this tool for justice. What nation outside our bubble, I, I call our West a bubble, what nations or governments who are maybe a little less democratic than we pretend to be, why would they abide by a finding of the working group of arbitrary detentions when they can say, why should we, when the Swedes and the British government are dismissing it totally? So by ignore, ignoring that finding, they destroyed the mechanism which has been extremely important in the past in the fight 
to free political dissidents and imprisoned people around the world. So that was one example. Another example is, 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 is Niels Melcher, the special rapporteur on torture, that wrote the book. He wrote the book because he was astonished by the fact that he was totally ignored, undermined, and uh, uh, his message was, 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 was uh, uh, ignored totally. That is another part of this erosion. Uh, the little nibbling of the international order which, which we've been fighting post-World War II to implement is being eroded over this, this period and, and Julian Assange's case has been uh, uh, symptomic of that. Um, of course, we are now seeing not just nibbling off that, but a huge chunk being bitten off. Uh, and, but it all started somewhere, and you get, you get to bug, bigger bites. So we are seeing a very serious trend, which doesn't surprise us who have been being in this fight for the th last 13 years, because this is all a continuation of what's been going on. Um, you, I have, I have mentioned the, uh, the, the Dreyfus affair before because it's very... I did it in the beginning to say, don't give up. Uh, in in 18, what was it, 1897, I think it was, uh, when, 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 when Dreyfus was shipped over to Devil's Island, there was, I assume everybody knows the, the Dreyfus affair here. Um, uh, the Americans tend not to know about it, not even the Brits. However... The, the, uh, and I told, I told people, don't give up the fight, please help us. It, there was nobody around to help uh, him in the beginning. It was only his brother. Then he got the intellectuals uh, uh, on board, and, 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 and which resulted in this uh, you know, famous article by, by M. Zola, which he pays the heavy price for. He actually had to seek refuge in the United Kingdom uh, from, from prosecution in France, ironically. So I, I said, don't give up. It, it, a small group, group can have a, a tremendously big imp impact. Uh, and, uh, but you, you need to stay on the battle. Uh, I don't reflect too much to that case before, because I told everybody back in the days, in 2013, I said, that the Dreyfus affair was, from the beginning to the end, a 10-year fight. 10 years after he was sent to... Uh, the Devil's Island, he came back and he was reinstated into his old position, mm. and totally exonerated. Mm. Our fight is now 13 years, and it's not over. Mm. Um, there is an implication in your question about why on earth, uh, that's probably a question for me <laughs> rather than you, why on earth are journalists not doing more? Why do journalists not see seriousness of the situation. Um, I don't know. I, I decided very young uh, to become a journalist and I spent more than 20 years in the mainstream media. I had huge faith in journalism as being an element in keeping order in our society. I have to admit that my faith has a little bit eroded. And I can give you one example of the utter silence that is going on and the lack of pushback by journalists. And I, 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 I just simply don't understand why people in the profession do not kick and scream louder when their, in, their own interests are being attacked so blatantly. Um, this is a very little known. Very slowly and gradually, of course, it's like a disease. Uh, 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 it's like a virus against press freedom that is... It's a pandemic against press freedom that's going on. And we are not resisting. We are putting our mask on, not for protection, but for, to, for being silent when it comes to this pandemic against press freedom. Let me give you one example. This, this uh, notorious uh, uh, abuse of the uh, Espionage Act against a journalist in the United States unfortunately gave the British government an idea that they should, they should also implement a similar thing. And lo and behold, 
uh, a few weeks ago in December, uh, the National Security Act in the UK government came into force. It is inspired and a copycat of the Espionage Act. And it can and will be used against journalists in the United Kingdom or foreign journalists working in the United Kingdom. Have you heard anything about it? There is nobody who has ever, ever covered it. And the serious issue is this. When this was being debate, debated in the British Parliament, frequently the, uh, the proponents of these, this National Security Act used a reference to Wikileaks and Julian Assange when arguing the need for it. We need to stop another Wikileaks to occur. Can you imagine? We don't want our secrets to be exposed when it's uncomfortable for us. Let's make a legal tool to stop it. So this is a part of the pandemic against press freedom, mm. which journalists need to wake up to that reality before they are totally put to sleep altogether. Mm. Sorry for the harsh <laughs> words, but I think it's needed. Denis Masmojan. Uh, yes, thank you. you, you your, your question is very important. Um, I, I can't um, answer on behalf of all journalists of all of the world. I just can uh, answer on behalf of my organization. I can assure you that we are very committed. We, we, we are working very, very hard to, uh, on this case. We are perfectly aware of all you are, what you are, what you are, you are saying. Um, I think um, we are uh, we are very we are explaining very clearly what is at stake in this case. Uh, one possible explanation why the journalist, uh, as, you, as you said, I think. Journalists uh, are spending a lot of time to know and to discuss if Julian Assange is a journalist or not. It's, it's a possible explanation. We answer this question as I said. We are very clear on this topic. We are convinced that uh, Assange's contribution to journalism was extremely important and we are convinced that he, he played a role, ex, an extremely important role in, 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 uh, in uh, a journalistic work and we are defending him as such. I don't know if uh, I answer your question correctly. Mm -hmm. Okay. May, may, I, may I just simply... Uh, yeah, add, briefly, add, because add, we have a few questions online yeah, and here too. Just, just to, the, the, just to emphasise that journalistic freedom is not for journalists, it's for journalism. Yes. And, and for the public. And for the public. They have a right to journalism. It's not the, our prerogative to be defended as individuals. It's the, it's the act itself. And, and for God's sake, I'm mean, so tired of debating the fact that Julian is a journalist or not. He's, he's a card-holding union member of the Australian Journalism Union, MEAA, since 2006 and has won more prizes than any journal journalistic prizes that anybody could imagine. Mm -hmm. Here, some uh, question here, uh, and then we have a few questions online, and then I pass you the microphone, sure. Thank you. Uh, my name is Serena Tinari. I am a Swiss investigative journalist and I am with a group that is an international initiative that is called Journalist Speak Up for Assange. Uh, we are over 2,000 from 130 countries, but I totally share your views. It's quite complicated. And we launched this in 2019 and we should be by now alpha million, I would say, but we are about 2,000. However, uh, that could be a long debate. There are many reasons, probably. My understanding is some, many of our colleagues fell for propaganda. They fell for all the smearing about Julian Assange and eventually they don't feel like this is about them. I think they have quite some distance from the case. However, my question is about what's going to happen next week. I'm aware that in Switzerland, on the 20, 
there will be a, a demonstration, a public event in Bern. Uh, maybe you can give us an overview of what we can expect worldwide to happen next week. Thank you. Yeah, I think I, I just want to reiterate that I, I don't want to sound uh, ungrateful for the great work that some journalists have done. And I mean, I, th there are not all uh, that have uh, overlooked the importance of the case for their interest and for press freedom in general. I mean, uh, really uh, a, a powerful, good work that has been done, uh, as you were outlining, and uh, that, that, uh, that we are very grateful for. Uh, what is going to happen in the, uh, uh, during the dates, there will be protests in, uh, and, uh, in, in, uh, in cities around the world. Uh, you can, you can uh, see that on, on the website freeassance.com. Uh, .org, the, where, where what is happening uh, all around the world. In this, uh, in this country, um, they will be uh, uh, on uh, um, uh, in 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 Bern uh, on the twentieth. Hand, uh, an official handover, the, an open letter to the UK and the US embassy. Uh, that is on happening on the twentieth uh, on uh, four thirty in the afternoon. Uh, we even have events now in Bern on uh, Friday, coming Friday at four o'clock at in Tunplatz. Uh, in front of the UK Embassy in Zurich on Saturday at two o'clock. These are, are examples uh, of, uh, of, uh, of actions that are going to be taken and are going to, happening, uh, uh, going to be happening all over the world. Um, a, a bit of a disconcern, I mean, Reporters Without Borders, are really, I'm really grateful for that work they've done and uh, Rebecca Vincent, uh, uh, on your behalf, has been uh, constantly monitoring the proceedings, and that is one of the worrying aspects of it, but because it's supposed to be going to be an open court, and that's what we expect in a democratic country, but as that has been anything but. It's been very hard to get seats in the public gallery. Uh, we don't even now know whether they're going to stream from the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the courtroom. Uh, at least I haven't had this morning any confirmation it's going to happen. So it is not that much of an open court. So we rely very much on uh, 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 reporters with our borders to be our court inspectors to, uh, to, to keep in check the powers. And my God, they, they definitely need that. And just to add a little bit that it's not just every major organization in the world today that, that cares about freedom of speech and the freedom of the press are now on site. They have warned, they are warning about the implication there. This is not a fringe uh, issue anymore. Everybody understands. Okay, we'll take a first question online. Um, so I'll let you, Tobias, read the first question online. Oh, we have someone directly online. So. Yeah. Are you... Shall I speak? Do you hear me? Okay, yes, we can hear you, so we can listen to you, so you can ask your questions. Please no. uh, tell who you are first. Uh, my name is Alexander Elmer. I live in Switzerland. I work as an independent uh, cyber, cyber security manager. Um, two brief comments. First of all, thank you very much for all the things you're doing to try to save Julian Assange. She deserves it. I was very shocked when I saw these images in London when they, they caught him at the embassy. Uh, that is something that is a shame, honestly. Um, so I have two questions, one to you, Christine, and then a, a more general question to, to the um, Reporters Sans Frontières in Switzerland. The first one is, did you have any uh, contacts with the uh, European authorities in different level and how far have they been supportive for your case? And then the question to Reporters Sans Frontières, why are the Swiss media so silent? Thank you very much. Uh, well, the question of w whether we've been uh, uh, trying to get support from uh, politicians in, in, uh, on the, uh, uh, in Europe, uh, yes, we've been knocking on every possible door. 
uh, to try to get uh, support uh, for Julian. There are in now, I believe, in 14 countries, parliamentary groups uh, in various shape and form uh, who are uh, parliamentarians supporting Julian Assange. That, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and in the European Parliament as well. So we do have political support, but when it comes to the uh, top layer, there is silence and indifference, and uh, nobody seems to be uh, wanting to step out of line and, uh, and criticize uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the world police who wants Julian Assange to, to rot in their prison. Uh, one very uh, illustrative example is, for example, that the current uh, foreign minister in Germany uh, was very outspoken and supportive for Julian Assange uh, up until the, the moment that he stepped into government and became foreign minister in the current government. Uh, then it's been total silence and journalists have been trying to uh, force Baerbock to uh, issue a statement on, on behalf of Julian, but there has been, uh, there is uh, there is uh, nobody answering the door when that's, uh, that knock is on there. So it, that is that is the, the harsh reality that, uh, that we are dealing with, but it, there is political support. Okay, Denis Mesmejean, why are the Swiss media, why do they seem so silent? Do you have an explanation? So, as, as I said, I have no, um, no uh, clear and definitive answer to, to your question. Um, it, uh, I, I mentioned one of the possible explanations, as I said, um, possibly, uh, possi it is possible that journalists um, are not uh, very clear about um, the question whether Julian Assange is a journalist or, or not, and if he is not uh, to be considered as a journalist, it's uh, perhaps more difficult to 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 defend him. Uh, um, as, as a journalist, so it's, it's one, one aspect. As I said, we, we, we have uh, uh, an answer to, to this uh, question. I don't uh, want to repeat my position, uh, my, my conviction. Um, we have been doing our best to, to convince the, the, the media. So you, you have to ask the media uh, we have to ask the question directly to the media. Thank you. We'll have a, um, a second question online then. then. Uh, we can read the question maybe, or is it? We have one question from, actually two questions from uh, Amel Debe. She is first to answer to Mr. Denis Masmajan. Even if Julian Assange is not considered as a journalist, isn't he at least a source who has to be protected? I think the question has been answered, but... Mm. Okay, and maybe the second question, so we can have some more questions here. And uh, do Julian Assange and his team feel betrayed by the press's lack of interest in his plight? The lack of interest in the press? Was that the question? Of the press, by, by the press. Um, uh, to some extent, but uh, I... I don't want to uh, to uh, to add to my rather critical words in the uh, earlier here. Um, we I, I, I do understand that that, that journalists uh, can of course be misled, uh, and it has happened over and over again over in my career. Uh, let's not forget how, how how the press was misled in the entire world. Uh, uh, before the uh, invasion in Iraq in 2003, with all the, uh, the BS about uh, weapons of mass destruction, uh, uh, what have you. But the press did wake up after that. It took a, took a while, but it, it, it did acknowledge that they had been misled and, uh, and, and did uh, push the narrative back on track. Uh, I, am, I am waiting for that to happen in, in Julian's case. But uh, there are so many factors that come in here. Um, but uh, there needs to be an awakening. But it's an, because it's an it's it's an existential question for journalists and journalism. Uh, 
for a very long time there has been this question about the, uh, the, uh, uh, the technological changes which undermine journalistic practices, uh, lack of funding for uh, genuine journalistic work. I've, I, I know that debate, it's been going on for decades. But now it's about the, uh, the, basic, the basics, the existence of the right to be a journalist. So um, I don't feel betrayed. They are betraying themselves and the entire concept of journalism. Okay, question here. Hello, my name is Antoine. I'm a um, host of the media, the Swiss Box Conversation, and I have a question for Denis Masmejean, a uh, reporter without border. Because I'm always suspicious when someone says, uh, we've been very clear, we've been very clear for a long time. A uh, politician tends to, to do that and says nothing. And have, like, I have to build trust with a reporter without border, which I don't have yet. So my question is this, is Julian Nessand a journalist for reporter without border, yes or no? It's a very easy question. When did you start supporting Assange as an organization? And what do you, what do you specifically think about Mark Pompeo and the CAR pl plot to assassinate East Assange? And what are the uh, reporter without border stands on that specific subject? And uh, that would be good if you... So, um I have to, to repeat myself, so... so. Yes, no. yeah. Is Julian is Assange a journalist for you? He, he, as I said, oh. he contributed oh, okay. uh, to um, uh, a, a huge journalistic no, work. No, 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 no. Okay. I, I repeat what okay. I said. Uh, okay. The, okay. Do, does Reporters Without Borders ever comment about uh, Mark Pompeo's uh, plan about? It's obvious we condemned this. This uh, mm. we, we, we mm. condemned uh, this. It's, it's mm. obvious. Mm. Okay. Um, any other question here? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, from, for the uh, weekly Geneva Observer, Stephanie Nebehe. I just wondered if you, um, the gentleman, the former rapporteur here, has talked about the UN speaking out, Niels and the working group against arbitrary detention over the years. Um, but the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, OHCHR, has been very guarded. I wondered if you could comment or whether you have comments with them or expect any statements or pressure from them even behind the scenes, if you're clear on the distinction between the rapporteurs who are independent, unpaid experts, and the OHCHR itself, now headed by Volker Turk. Was it, it was for me, I, 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 I gather, right. Um, I, uh, I have expectations uh, of uh, to uh, to the entire uh, apparatus uh, on all levels to come to the support of Julian Assange and acknowledging the importance of uh, the issue. Uh, on specifics, uh, I'm not into the details of uh, the wonderful people working um, on the, the level here in, in Geneva, and uh, uh, we have very good support. Um, but uh, yes, the. Uh, uh, the UN system in general, and it's part of the problem that we are discussing here earlier, of course, is under attack, the entire idea, and, uh, the, uh, and it's a, uh, the, the, the scenario that we are facing, an attack on the international order, and that is uh, very much pointed out uh, the many levels and, of, and, and facets of the United Nations. I, I just want to uh, add a little bit to, to, to the, the note here on on, uh, uh, on, on the question of journalists and not journalists. Uh, I, I, 
I beg to, uh, to sort of shy away from uh, the uh, potato potato question here. What I'm saying is that we are defending journalistic practices and uh, it, is a, it, it is a wide and widening concept and we should not be um, we should not be lost, losing ourselves in the details there. I can give you one example. The, one of the best court reporter in Julian Assange's case is, is my friend Craig Murray, a former ambassador in the UK and a whistleblower. He did absolutely fantastic work in analyzing the court case in Julian. He was in court with Rebecca Vincent from Reports of the Borders, and he wrote an absolutely astonishingly good analysis of the court and knowledgeable. Uh, he is a blogger, uh, according to some, and a non-journalist to some others. It doesn't really matter. He is doing journalistic work, and a hell of a good work, which uh, shames a lot of other journalists. So, what I'm saying is here, let's not be lost in the details. It's about the essence of what is behind journalists because the technological changes and our world we live in is going to erode the lines. And uh, it, it is, uh, we should not be you know, safeguarding some petty, narrow just if, uh, definition of, of, uh, of, of who is what in what role because we know, we all know the essence the essence of what needs to be protected, and that is journalism. Here, another question on, on the same topic. Per, per oh, okay, Denis, okay. I, I, I just uh, would add uh, some words because uh, there was perhaps uh, a misunderstanding, a misconception. If you want to hear from me that Julian Assange is a journalist, I can say yes, is a journalist for me, clearly. But as I uh, tried to explain for our organization, the, the point is not really here. The point is the, what is at stake is, are the consequences of this affair for journalism in general and for press freedom. And as I said, this affair is a dangerous precedent for press freedom and journalists. Is it okay? Okay, thank you. A question here. Yeah. Uh, good morning to both of you. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. My name is Louis Chenay. I'm working as communication officer uh, at the World Organization Against Torture, OMCT. I do have a question for you, Christine. Uh, it's very simple. I would like to know what's, what has been the, how much affected has been WikiLeaks uh, in, in its operations uh, since the start of this uh, political persecution in 2010. Thank you very much. Well, of course, the organization has been affected and uh, uh, by it. And in uh, the, uh, the last couple of years, we have been putting, uh, we're a small organization, so we have put all our resources to to uh, to, to uh, focus on the campaigning facts uh, to save Julian Assange uh, and uh, um, and in that process to save journalism. So um, that is, I hope uh, uh, we can be excused to to have uh, uh, to be a little bit on the, um, uh, the the sideline when it comes to publications, uh, but uh, the explosive huge leaks uh, do not happen every day, so uh, there are often years in between uh, of uh, earth-shattering uh, stories, so uh, bear with me. The concept is there, the legacy is there, um, but now my priority as the uh, sort of in charge there is to fight for Julian's freedom, to get him out, because his voice is needed and probably WikiLeaks is needed more than ever, not just the actual practice, but the concept and the ideals, the very highly uh, 
journalistic ideals which are underlying the organization and which I was smitten by in 2010 uh, as a 2.0 of, of journalism and, 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 and jumped on board and have been there. But now we have to save a life and we have to save the life of journalism. Um, when we get him out, I say when, uh, I, I hope that Julian will, will, uh, will, will, will get back to work, but I will understand he needs a lot of time to recover. But uh, most importantly, I think he has tremendously important words to contribute to our current debate, which is a debate about the future of our civilization. Thank you. Here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Gianfranco Fattorini with the Movement Against Racism and for French Among Peoples uh, in Paris. And uh, I wanted just to come back to this issue, whether uh, Julian is a journalist or not journalist, because for years in the Human Rights Council, discussion about the, the resolution of safety of journalists, this question was raised mainly uh, by some governments that are not really for freedom of uh, the press. And uh, finally, uh, the solution was also to discuss about bloggers and uh, online, offline freedom of expression. But also there is the, the other side of the coin, uh, which is the right to be informed. And uh, this is for everybody. It's everybody, right? Uh, whether the, the, the information comes from a journalist and uh, each government states has its rules to determine who is journalist, but the right to be informed uh, is open. I mean, uh, anybody can inform the public, and this is the real issue. And uh, of course, journalists doesn't speak, but then there is also the issue to, to see who is uh, managing uh, the, the mainstream uh, press uh, uh, online, offline. And uh, finally, I wanted also to add about uh, the manifestation on the 20th. Uh, we have also called, there is a 50, about 50 organizations in France uh, that have called for a manifestation in many towns, Paris, Strasbourg, uh, Metz, uh, uh, Bastia, in course. Thank you. Thank you. So I guess all informations about uh, the manifestations on uh, freeassange.org. Uh, we'll take a last question, uh, because I know there are a few uh, interviews who, want to, who still need to be uh, held here. Sir. Very briefly, Julian Assange has been nominated to the uh, Nobel Peace Prize repeatedly, year after year. And um, the late Frederick uh, Heffermail of uh, the Nobel Peace Prize Watch just published a book in December last year called The uh, Real Nobel Peace Prize in which he uh, says that Obviously, Assange, because of what he has done, opened our eyes to the horrors of war. That is important as a contribution to peace, to world peace, is that everybody realize how horrible the war is and how horrible the things that, in the name of the United States, and I'm an American citizen, uh, I like to shout, not in my name, but in any event, it is important that we know that our governments are committing war crimes and crimes against humanity. That alone, this realization, is justification for him to get the Nobel Peace Prize. Do you see a movement this year, 2024, again to nominate him to the Nobel Peace Prize? Yeah, I certainly hope that that will uh, that will uh, will uh, uh, that will rise, and uh, I I hope that uh, we will again see that movement, uh, uh, and I believe that it's already happening. Um, I wanna I wanna take um, a note of uh, uh, and and Denise pointed out earlier that and you're you're absolutely right uh, that. It is about the people's right to know. 
it's not about journalist right, and we have discussed it here. And I, a, a little thing come to mind here when, when you were posing a question that I want to point out. It's one of the most unreported judicial decision in the United States ever in its history. And I, it uh, was in the summer of 2019, in June, I believe, in, uh, in a courtroom in New York. There was not a single mention of it in the, in the entire United States, mostly liberal media. Nobody mentioned it. It was a, a case against Julian Assange by the Democratic National Committee, who was outraged by the exposure of 2016 in the United States, exposing corruption within the Democratic Party uh, against Bernie Sanders on behalf of Hillary Clinton. Uh, so. The D Democratic Party sued Julian Assange, and that was taken into court in, uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in New York, and was thrown out. And if you want to read a brilliant analysis of what Wikileaks is about, I urge you to try to find that court uh, document uh, from uh, the, the excellent judge, Coetl, who dismissed the case, and he dismissed it with prejudice, so it cannot be brought up again anywhere. And he talks about the First Amendment, which is exactly about the people's right to know. And he said, and we're talking about here journalistic practice, he said, the people do have the right to know what is going uh, uh, on in the, behind the curtains, in the back rooms of one of the major, two major political parties in this country. Julian Assange and Wikileaks had the full right to publish this information because the people had the right to know. And I'm paraphrasing, but he says, this completely and squarely fits an activity firmly protected by the First Amendment of the United States Constitution, thereby case dismissed. The liberal media in the United States did not want to report on this. It went totally silent. There was radio silence. I'm pretty certain it's the first time you've, most of you have heard about it. But it was brilliantly, at least to see by one single court judge in the United States, to understand the issue. But unfortunately, he is not going to hear the case of Julian Assange. It is the spy court in the Eastern District of Virginia where the jury pool are either indirectly or friends and family of the employees of the CIA, the State Department, and etc. in that area. That's why it's called the spy court because the United States government has a pretty good proportionality when it comes to winning its espionage cases there. And the proportion is 100% conviction rate. That's justice for you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us today, Denis Masmejean and Christine Rafson. Uh, of course, you stay. You are available for more interviews or questions. But we'll start. We will. Um, we'll end now the uh, press conference. And of course, we'll all be um, in Bern or maybe Place des Nations here in Geneva uh, next week. And we, of course, are thinking so much about Stella Assange and Julian. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for you presence today and thank you uh, Christine and Denis thank you thank you online <laughs>